thank you for joining us on the Serpents and Doves podcast. This is a Reformed confessional podcast of two Baptists that want to help God's people who have been sent out into this world to fulfill Jesus' command to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We discuss the questions of our culture to help Christians give an answer. Welcome back to another edition of the Serpents and Doves podcast. Hope you're doing well this day. I'm Josh Walnofer, and I'm joined by my co-host, Frank Butler. And today on Serpents and Doves, we want to talk about the subject of prayer, and in particular, why Christians need to stop being creative in prayer and in worship. So Frank, you and I were just talking about a book that came out some years back called The Circle Maker and about some of the abuses we've seen in prayer and worship over the years. Can you give us a little intro into where we're going today? Where we're going today is essentially starting with the regulative principle and applying it to more than just the worship that we all think about for Sunday morning and about how we talk to God, how we pray to God, and how we live our lives as Christians. The book that we're talking about, The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson, it's the idea of a first century Jewish scholar who would go out into the wilderness when when he wanted it to rain and he would draw a circle and he would stand in the center of that circle and he would tell God, I'm not moving until you give rain. Like I said, we're starting from the regulative principle of worship, which means that we look at the scriptures and the scriptures determine how we're to do these things. And nowhere in scripture do we see it okay to stand anywhere and demand God do anything. So essentially what you're saying is that the heresy of the prosperity, name it and claim it gospel goes back to a first century rabbi who rejected Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's exactly what we're saying. And which is important we point that out. The heresy of the prosperity, name it and claim it, it exists in more than just Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn. We acknowledge that that stuff is garbage, that stuff is heretical, that stuff is name it and claim it, but it doesn't just exist in the most obvious circles either. No pun intended with the obvious circles. No, that was a good one. So many evangelicals are using books like The Circle Maker to be creative in prayer and to find new ways to express themselves in prayer and new ways to have faith in God. But the reality is, this is not how we're called to pray. And we don't have a right, according not only to the regular principle, which is a scriptural principle, but we don't have a right by God's own standard to be creative in prayer. And real quick, what we mean by regulative principle, we're saying we're we're two of those crazy reform guys who believes the Bible actually defines how we're to live life and worship God. And we're not allowed to do what God has not given us permission to do. I want to make a, a quick case for why I don't think we should be creative in prayer, and I'd love us to talk about it. So first off, my argument for why we should not be creative in prayer goes back to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it goes back to the Gospels. For instance, in the Gospel of Luke, you start out, and we find prayers in the Gospel of Luke. You find songs, if you will. You have the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, in Luke chapter 1. You have the Benedictus, the Song of Zacharias, the Prayer of Zacharias, in Luke chapter 1. And then in Luke chapter 2, you have the Song of Simeon. You have the Nuke Dimitis by Simeon. Now, why am I bringing those up? Because those are prayers that are immersed in the promises of the Old Testament, in particular the Psalms. So when these people were praying, they weren't being creative in prayer. They were repraying back to God the prayers of David and the Psalmists. And then you have Jesus as an example. When Jesus is on the cross, at his greatest moment of anguish, what is he praying? Well, he's praying Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, the end of Psalm 22 ends with the statement that says, It is complete, or it is finished. What does Jesus say on the cross? Well, he says the same thing. Jesus is praying Psalm 31. Into your hands I commit my spirit, O Lord. Jesus was praying the Psalms. And so, God has given us prayers to pray in his word. And if we follow the history of the church, God's people have always prayed God's word. Now, we're not saying you can't pray extemporaneously. But we have a tongue that God has already given us to pray and to be creative and to reject how God has taught us how to pray, whether it's the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 or whether it's an entire book of 150 chapters of prayers in the Psalms is to reject God's own method of prayer. So to be clear, we're not saying that you can't pray in your own way and that when you say the grace for the food at your house before dinner, you don't have to quote the Lord's Prayer to do that. You don't have to quote one of the Psalms precisely to do that. You're allowed to pray, you know, thank you, Lord, for the food you have placed before us today. And that is, that's acceptable. 
However, you are to follow the forms, the doctrines, and the standards set forth throughout the Word of God on how to speak to God. And the Word of God does tell us how to give that thing. So we could pray in Chronicles, all things come from you, O Christ, right? And Absolutely. we could give him the glory for the food and thanksgiving. Or thank you for giving us this day our daily bread. I mean, <laughs> the Scriptures give us a tongue to be able to express these things properly. Yeah, praying the Scriptures as a whole. That's the idea we're talking about here. We learn how to pray from God. We don't learn how to pray from books, from rabbis who are drawing circles creatively. And can I just say, if we are going to look at, at, at literature outside of the Word of God to learn to pray, let's look at the Book of Common Prayer before we look at Mark Batterson. Yeah, look at prayers of historic saints in the past, like the Valley of Vision, the Book of Common Prayer, the Church Fathers. These are all great places where we can see prayers. And by the way, they are all immersed in Scripture. They're not creative. They're not name it and claim it. They are prayers that are wholly dependent on who God is. So you keep using that phrase, name it and claim it. Well, let's define that for our listeners real quick, because we're probably both going to be saying that quite a bit throughout this podcast. Name it and claim it is a, a modern, charismatic, Pentecostal-type doctrine that says that because we are in the family of God, that we have the very same authority as God. And so, what does this mean? This means that as God is creator, I can turn water into wine, I mean water into welches, and, and um, as God can heal the lame man, and give him the ability to walk, and give the, the blind man eyes to see, so in the same way, God, when we pray, we don't pray a dependent prayer, we pray in authority demanding to move the arm of God. And we have the right to do that. In fact, some in the extremes of the charismatic movement have went so far to say that we are little gods, uh, men like Benny Hinn and others, and that we have the same authority as God, which sounds very Mormon, I must say. It doesn't sound very Christian at all. But that's what name it and claim it is. So this is stop being impoverished. Speak to your poverty and command riches in your life. Speak these things over your life or the lives of those around you. And God will be forced to answer the way you have commanded God. And so what we have is a total reversal of our relationship. Instead of like the last words Martin Luther ever wrote before he died were, we are beggars. This is true. We're not beggars anymore, humbly before an all-powerful all giving, all good God. Instead, we are like God, demanding and controlling and sovereign over the elements that we control. The New Testament refers to us as the bond servants, the slaves of Christ. The slave does not walk up to the king on the throne and tell him what he will grant him. No, the king tells the slave what he's going to do. Amen. Amen. We need to take a break and we'll be right back on segment two to talk more about how do you find a rhythm in prayer and what should we pray? Welcome back to segment two of the Serpents and Dust podcast. You ended the last segment talking about finding a rhythm in your prayer. And I would really be interested to hear that as somebody who has no God-given rhythm whatsoever. When we're in church on Sundays and people start clapping, you'll know where I'm at because everyone around me is looking directly at me with frustration. <laughs> That's so funny. You have three hands. I have a... Hey, That's because you got babies, though. Yeah, we'll blame it on them. Actually, they got better rhythm than I do, and they're two. Not all theological minds can clap. So... Rhythm. Let's talk about rhythm for a minute. I believe wholeheartedly that the reason why Jesus could pray the Psalms on the cross is because he had, as a rhythm, prayed the Psalms his whole life. The reason why Mary could pray the Magnificat is because she had prayed consistently her whole life. The reason why someone at their deathbed can pray Psalm 23 or the Lord's Prayer is because they've prayed it their whole life. So these are not simply words on a page. This is their tongue. This is their common offering to God in prayer. So Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven, which reminds us whenever we pray, we're united with the whole church. So it's very important to think prayer is not simply a personal event. It is a communal event. Now we should pray personally, but when we pray, we're joining saints all around the world, the host of believers in heaven in a very united communal way. And we're praying together. The church throughout the ages has always emphasized not just extemporaneous prayer, but heartfelt prayer. And a prayer that comes from your heart is not as simply a scripted prayer, meaning a prayer that you just keep trying to, to pray as many as you can. It's a prayer that you have memorized, that is in your very soul. So what do you do with this? How do you get rid of on. That you can meditate on. So how do you do that? Well, first off, the church has always prayed at evening 
two prayers. The church has historically prayed Mary's Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. They've prayed that at nighttime. They've prayed the song of Simeon. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen the Savior. He's the light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Prayer of committing yourself to Christ at night. Or Psalm 31, into your hands I commit my spirit. Why have those psalms been prayed? How about Psalm chapter 4? I will lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. They were written to give us a prayer to God before we rest at night, to put our trust in him. The church has historically prayed in the morning the Benedictus, the prayer in Luke 1, the prayer of Zacharias, where he says, Blessed be the Lord. And this is a prayer to start your day. The church has historically prayed prayers like Lamentations 3. It's of the mercies of the Lord that were not consumed. His compassion fails not. It's new every morning. Or Psalm 5, uh, another morning prayer. So my point is that if we pray these prayers daily, I'm going to pray that same prayer every day for a whole week or for a whole month. You're not going to simply read words off a page. You're going to memorize it. It's going to be your common tongue. You had mentioned earlier the Book of Common Prayer. It might be weird for a Baptist to talk about the Book of Common Prayer, but I'd like to read for our listeners just two short prayers. I'd like to read two of the night prayers. I pray these with my children just about every night. The first one, it's a short little prayer. It says, Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now my kids, when they pray, they often repeat that prayer when they're praying extemporaneously, when they're praying off the cuff, because it's a part of their tongue. Or how about this one? Listen to this one. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Saints of old crafted these prayers from Scripture. And you pray that every night, you start to have a rhythm. Now, you can break that prayer up. Well, who are the people I know that are sick that need prayer? Who are the people that are in jail that need prayer? Who are the people that are homeless that need prayer? But when you get a rhythm in your prayer life of following these prayers of the saints, it is a powerful thing. And it's so much better than having to be creative every night. What do we pray about tonight? Well, God's already told us what we should pray about tonight. Or how about Psalm 134? Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, that by night stand in the house of the, the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. I mean, these are prayers that have been the common tongue, and we should pray for the church at large that evening while we go to bed. This is what I mean by a rhythm. You should be able to know God's word because you're praying the same prayers consistently and slowly, hopefully learn all 150 psalms. You're rolling. Don't stop. <laughs> like, seriously, I keep going. <laughs> One of the Psalms that came to my mind that I've prayed numerous times throughout my life, Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you, mm -hmm. O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Yes. Uh, sometimes when we pray or we hear other people pray, there's a lot of stuttering, a lot of pause, and there's a lot of uncertainty on what to say. And I think that exists in a lot of ways because we're not praying when God has already give us, given us to pray in our private life. We're not thinking the way God thinks or the way the scriptures have taught us to think. And that's not to put down someone that has that, that struggle. That's to actually encourage us to, there is a more foundational way for you to look at prayer and for you to pray to your king. Amen. Yeah, 130 is a great prayer, um, a prayer for help in the midst of trouble when your soul's in anguish. Or like Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Same idea. I was just thinking another one that every Christian should be praying, and I would say often, is Psalm chapter 51. I mean, this is a prayer of, of repentance for sin. Create in me a clean heart. Be merciful to me, O Lord, according to your love and kindness. So the point of the second segment is that God has given us what he wants us to pray, and we make it our own because because he's given it to us. It's a gift to us. So we need to stop trying to figure out how to have more dominion or authority in prayer. We've already have exactly what God wants us to say, and the Lord will bless it as we use what he's given us for his glory and for our good. So with that, we're going to take a break and jump into segment three, and Frank, you're going to lead us off on that one on serpents and doves.
Welcome back to segment three, our final segment for this episode of the Serpents and Doves podcast. You mentioned um, in your last segment communal prayer, and you ended talking about Psalm 51. At our church, every Sunday, we pray Psalm 51 as a community, as a body, as a local body of believers confessing our sins before the Lord. And one of the things we want to talk about in this last segment is the idea that the church prays as a community and not just as individuals. So you have a lot to say about that topic. Just take it and run with it. Like I said earlier, the Our Father reminds us of this, but also Revelation makes it clear that we are joining the saints in heaven, the saints triumphant when we pray. We're joining the angels in worship. Every time we sing, we're joining the saints in worship. And we're joining believers all across different time zones, geographies, etc. There's always people bringing praise to our God. I was going to say, so one of the things you're assuming, though, when you say that is that we are praying when we come together as a body. We're not to come together for our Sunday assembly just to sing some good, upbeat worship songs together, uh, toast our glasses and crackers, and listen to a guy talk for 10 minutes and go home. No, we're to, we're to bend the knee in prayer as Did a Did you community. just say toast your glasses and crackers? I'm not That throwing. sounded so Southern Baptist. I'm not throwing jabs at anybody. Wow. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're here for a purpose. We're here as part of a community. So we pray together. We, we should be confessing our sins together. We should be talking to our king together as a community. We should be singing these songs. Everything we've said so far about prayer from the scriptures can be applied to our singing as well. Yes. We should be doing these things as a community. So just speaking directly to the believer for a second, if you're attending a church that you can't remember the last time y'all prayed in church, you have to ask some questions. Yeah, and we don't mean prayed as in like 30-second prayers. We mean pastoral prayers where you're praying for the body, when you're praying for your community, when you're praying for the world. This should be a part of the normal rhythm of a church service. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer for all nations. And yet... How many people would show up on Sunday morning if we cut out the music and we just prayed and studied the Word? I bet our attendance would drop drastically. I know of a church recently that just did a a service where we only read the book of Galatians with no singing or anything else, and we actually had pretty fair attendance. (laughs) We did. That was our church, and it was was a joy. I mean, we, we filled our gym up, which was nice for that special service. Heard so much good feedback whenever we do those nights of just Scripture and prayer together. And so the more the church prays, we're going to realize our dependence on scripture for prayer. Because when you have to be creative and come up with a prayer, and you have to invent new ideas to to keep prayer contemporary or to keep prayer cutting edge, it's at that point that you've taken God out of the equation. Because he doesn't want those kind of prayers. He doesn't ask us for those kind of prayers. He wants humble dependence on him based on who he is and what he has revealed. And so every church should have a prayer of confession. Every church should have pastoral prayers. First Timothy 2, every church should pray for their leaders and those in authority. Pray for Jeremiah 29, for the good of their city, the shalom, the peace of the city that they're called into. Every church should be praying for their children. Jesus said, let them come to me and do nothing to hinder them, right? Every church should be praying about their national sins. I mean, if your congregation hasn't prayed in repentance for abortion, if your church hasn't prayed in repentance for injustice, if your church hasn't prayed for repentance over our leaders and the ungodly example, then we are not teaching our people how to pray properly. One of the things we're also assuming then, and if you're a pastor listening to this, take this as as a possibility of application, do you want to help your church pray more in your assemblies, then be intentional about a liturgy. Then be intentional about a direction of your service. Be intentional about what you're doing on that morning. One of the things that I love about our church, and we, we've, we've touted our church quite a bit in this podcast. but Which is rare. We usually don't. Yeah, we usually don't. Um, we're not going to give you the name so you don't egg the church or anything. <laughs> but one of the things we do well in our church, though, is I know on Sunday mornings how many times we're going to pray and how, how often we're going to pray and when in the service we're going to pray. That liturgy helps us as a church develop our prayers and to be intentional about our praying. We don't have to do something cool and unique and that's flashy with mirrors to get people's attention that we're talking to God. No, we're just intentional about the prayer we're doing rather than just writing something off to get it done. Yes. So just to let you know, and and our way isn't the only way, and it's surely not the God-inspired way, but it is a scriptural way. So we start every service with a call to worship from God's Word and a time of prayer just calling us into asking for the Lord's blessing. And then after a song or two, we will have a prayer of confession of sin and then a pastoral prayer where we pray for the people, for the nation, for the city, for other churches, for 
needs that are important to the body. Then we will have a scripture reading where we have another prayer, where we actually pray back whatever the reading of scripture was. And then we sing another song, and then we have the offering. And when we take up our offering, we have another prayer during the offering, where we pray for God's blessing and provision and often other needs, the military, church planners, things of this nature. And then we have the sermon, and we read the scriptures of the sermon, that the text that will be preached, and then with the pastor prays again for God's help and revelation in that time of worship. And then he closes the sermon in prayer, followed by another song of response, followed by a prayer of benediction to close the service. We start with prayer, we end with prayer. Prayer lines the entire service. And so we might be praying six, seven times in a service. I can tell you this, the only thing we could do better is pray more, not pray less. Amen. And if you notice, um, as Josh, you laid out our way of service, our liturgy, if you will, uh, you left out the altar call that most churches hold, which you would think on an episode talking about prayer and the importance of it, we would have talked about that in regards to our liturgy, but we didn't do that. There's a reason we didn't do that. And, and I'll tell you right now at Root, it's grounded in the regular principle of worship. But if you tune in in a couple weeks to a new episode we're going to be doing, it's going to be one of our bigger episodes. We're going to talk about why the regular principle of worship doesn't allow for us to do things like we see in the modern church with the invitation. No, we sure will. So just in closing, here's my challenge for you. You can't probably change what your church does today, but you can change what you do. So if you have a family or if you're by yourself, every night start praying a psalm. Start praying Psalm chapter 4. How about that? And start praying the Lord's Prayer. Do it for a month, 30 days. So it becomes a common part of your soul and your tongue. Again, pray Psalm 23 every night for a month. Pray in Luke, look up Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 2, pray the prayers that the believers prayed at the birth of the Messiah every day. Just just pick a few of them and pray them every day. Morning, pray them. Night, pray them. Lunchtime, pray them. As well as your normal prayer. And let God begin to change your life and your heart. And you'll see that they will mean more to you. So what we're saying here, essentially, you should be spending time in prayer. Yes more so than we do as a community and more so than we do as individuals. I love what you just said a second ago about when we pray throughout the day. Um, what we've tried to do, what I've tried to emphasize in our household is the pastor prays the pastoral prayers for the church and the community on Sunday mornings. We sit down at the table together and around the word of God at home and I pray with our family. And then before I go to bed in my private time, I pray between me and my Lord myself. Yes, that's good. So with that, we hope that you take this today and apply it in your church and apply it in your life individually and see the fruit that God produces in your life. Tune in next week for a new and exciting episode. Grace and peace. Thank you for listening today on the Serpents and Doves podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please hit like and share with your friends. We can also be found on iTunes, Google Play, and Podbean. If you like what you heard, give us a five-star rating. If you did not, head over to the Facebook page and tell us why. Until next time, grace and peace. Shine.